So in that sense, I want to democratize the, 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 the story of innovation. I'm, I want to make it clear that anyone can do it. The basic question that a writer asked, I think, is what should I write about? And um, you know, it, it's, it, that's the biggest question. You know, there's no help for you either. Uh, and it's, it's a total mystery. But what is common throughout history, throughout time, is that when you have that upstairs, downstairs thing, there's a certain amount of that that you can maintain if you're on top through hard power and hard system. We're absolutely delighted to be back here with our edition, albeit digitally, of JLF Houston. There are so many wonderful authors and speakers who you will hear over the next few days. And I hope they will power your imagination as they have ours to look into the future, into a brighter tomorrow. On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, Asia Society, and in print, we welcome you to this session of JLF Houston 2021 Virtual Festival. Presenting Epic Women, Namta Gokhale, Ira Mukhoti, and Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni in conversation with Sunit Tandar. A long time ago in the ancient lands of India, known in those days as Bharat Varsh, a family quarrel grew into a bloody war. There has been wars before, and there have been wars since. But that mighty battle between warring cousins of the Kuru clan has become a part of the essence of India. The Mahabharata is one of the two major Sanskrit epics of, no of ancient India. Today, we present a powerful session that pays tribute to the women of the Mahabharata as they argue, plead, reason, and rise from the embers of the grand epic that often focuses only on heroic men. Three masters of the narrative craft speak to Sunit Tandon about the many variations of this foundational text, the role of women within it, and their vivid and resonating voices. Namita Gokhale is an award-winning Indian writer. She's authored 20 books, including 11 works of fiction. Her first book, Paru, remains a cult classic, and her novel, Jaipur Journals, was published recently as was Betrayed by Hope, a play on the poet Michael Madhusudan Dutt. Her latest novel is The Blind Matriarch. Gokhale is a co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival and deeply committed to supporting translations and curating literary dialogues across languages and cultures. Ira Mukhoti is the author of Akbar, The Great Mughal, Daughters of the Sun, Empresses, Queens and Begums of the Mughal Empire, and heroines, powerful Indian women in myth and history. Living in one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, she developed an interest in the evolution of mythology and history, the erasure of women from these histories, and the continuing relevance this has on the status of women in India. Song of Draupadi is her first novel. Chitra Banerjee Devakaruni is the best-selling and award-winning author of 19 books, including Palace of Illusions, Forest of Enchantments, and her newest novel, The Last Queen. Her works have been translated into 29 languages. She teaches creative writing at the internationally recognized creative writing program at the University of Houston. Sunit Tandon is director of the India Habitat Center and president of the Delhi Music Society. He was formerly Director General IIMC, CEO of the Lok Sabha TV, and Festival Director of IFI, amongst holding other positions. He has been a television anchor, radio broadcaster, and music critic. He's also a theatre and film actor and stage director. Please do follow our social media handles to get notifications of, on the upcoming sessions. In these difficult times, we've struggled to bring you JLF Houston 2021 without charging a registration fee. Please support us as generously as you can to ensure the free and seamless flow of knowledge. Simply click on the support JLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. Your contribution is greatly appreciated. Ladies and gentlemen, epic women, Namita Gokhale, Ira Mukhoti and Chitra Banerjee Divakaruni in conversation with Sunit Tandon.
Over to you, Sunit. Thank you very much indeed, Sharupa. It's a great pleasure indeed for me to be in conversation with three such stellar contemporary women writers who have dealt very sensitively and powerfully with so many uh, women of the subcontinent, both historical, contemporary, as well as, of course, mythological, going back to our great epics. And that is the subject of conversation today, because all three have also uh, made their own versions, interpretations of various aspects of the greatest epic, perhaps, of mankind, uh, which is the Mahabharat, the longest poem, ancient poem, and uh, for those who may not be familiar with the Mahabharat, it is actually imbued in the blood of almost every Indian. And we all know the stories because they've been told to us by our grandmothers, by our parents and uh, uncles and aunts. And we, there are stories within stories within stories in the Mahabharat. It's a very complex epic, unlike the more linear narrative of the other epic, uh, the great Indian epic, the Ramayana. And therefore, it's always been very fruitful ground for people to take and reinterpret in whichever way. And reinterpretation of the epics in India is an old and hoary tradition. Every region, every language, every area has their own version and the continuously evolving versions have contributed to these epics. So today, it's such a pleasure to talk to three authors who have involved themselves, immersed themselves into the epic of the Mahabharat and taken aspects of it, which is the forever fascinating character of Draupadi, the woman who was a princess born of fire, married to five husbands, all brothers, and stayed with them through thick and thin, through all the travails they went through. Um, it's, it's coincidental perhaps, and I want to ask you, uh, Chitra first, uh, but, and then Ira second, because uh, you both selected this one character, Draupadi, uh, to focus your attention on, although I know Ira has written about some of the other women as well in her book, whereas Chitra's book is centered around uh, Draupadi, or Panchali, as she's often referred to, uh, which was her the name of her earlier name uh, in the Mahabharat. Uh, what made Draupadi particularly fascinating for you? Because even in Ira's book, she is the one whom the book is named after, even though the other women are also uh, referred to and uh, their stories are also told. So why did you pick Draupadi, first of all? And what is it that fascinates people so much about Draupadi? You are also all aware that in dance, Indian dance, which uses epics as its source, I have seen so many over the last decade or more interpretations of Draupadi. And Draupadi seems to be a character that fascinates everybody in our present times. So Chitra first, I mean, you, what made you pick Draupadi as a central character of your uh, interpretation called the Palace of Illusions? Yes. So when I was writing Palace of Illusions, it, it was, I knew right away that this was going to be Draupadi or Panchali's story. She says, I don't want to be called I don't want to be just known as the daughter of Drupad. I am from the land of Panchal, Panchal. So I'm Panchali. And that's her preferred name. So that's what I use in the Palace of Illusions because she is the most feisty of all the women in the Mahabharat. I think she is also, for me, she was the most complex one. She is also in a very unique situation. As you mentioned, she has five husbands, very unusual in our epic tradition, our mythological tradition, it's always the other way around. Uh, the heroes have many wives, uh, but it's very rare for a woman to have more than one husband and also to be considered then queenly and admirable. Well, uh, part of the issue with Draupadi is although they, she's considered admirable by certain people, a lot of people look at her negatively as well they say, well, Draupadi was the cause of the Mahabharat war, you know, uh, as they say, cherche la femme, look for the woman who's at, at the core of the problem. Well, people often pointed to Draupadi. But for me, she was fascinating because she managed the five husbands really well. She was a great, she was very intelligent. She guided them. She um, really 
from behind the scenes, she orchestrated the history of the Mahabharat quite a bit. So I wanted to bring out all of those aspects of her, plus the mystery born out of fire, not really wanted by her father. He just wanted a warrior son. She came along as a post postscript, and then he had to yeah. deal with her. Yeah. And one can never forget Draupadi. You have to deal with her because she makes her presence felt. So all of these reasons, uh, just, you know, she was like a magnet. I knew right away she no, was I... going to be the voice of the Palace of Illusions. Thank you, Jitra. Ira, you also chose her as the central binding narrative force in your uh, take on the Mahabharat, uh, which is uh, the Song of Draupadi. But you also wove in the stories of other very strong women from the epic in that book. Tell us about, um, first of all, I mean, when, when did you sort of think about doing this? Because I know you wrote this uh, novel about 10 years ago. Um, were That's you right. already aware of Chitra's work in this uh, field or were you not? Or was this a completely independent uh, kind of uh, piece of uh, serendipity that you also sort of chose Draupadi as a, as a central character in your novel? Yes. So, um, Sunit, thank you for that question. And, you know, who could uh, live in Delhi and not know of Chitra's book? Uh, of course, I knew of Palace of Illusions. But um, this, as you said, this work came about 10 years ago. And it came from a very personal space as, you know, actually most of my books tend to end up being from a very personal reaction to the world. And as you were saying, these myths are very much part of our lives, whether we want it or not, we absorb it through culture, through television, through dance performances, through our elderly, you know, parents, grandparents who might tell us these stories. So we absorb these stories bit by bit. And there was uh, an aspect that I sort of, was rebelling against at that point, which is the story of Sita in a way, you know. Uh, it, I was looking for an antidote to the Sitaification of our culture, that as young women growing up, we were often given Sita in some way or the other. We were force fed her in drips and drabs without even realizing, being told we should be certain ways in Indian society. Yeah. Not to love. Just for those who may not know it, Sita is the sort of pro protagonist, the female protagonist the of the Ramayana, That's which right. is the other epic, the other great yes. Indian epic. Of course. Yes. Sorry, I didn't. And she's supposed to be the perfect woman with the all perfect the perfect woman. qualities. Yes, exactly. Know? So she's okay. held up to us as a perfectly virtuous Indian woman, a perfect wife who commits no mistakes. And yet at the end of her life, she is nonetheless repudiated by her husband. So this used to trouble me because I have two daughters and I was wondering, how do I tell them this story that you have to be this perfect person, you know, this perfect woman in Indian society. And you even have something called the Rakshman Lekha, which is the way society brings in strictures for women. You cannot cross that line, imaginary line, but actually very real in society. You cannot dress a certain way, you cannot talk too loud or laugh too loud. So these were things that were troubling me. And I found in Draupadi almost an antidote to that, because in a way, if you think, uh, you know, uh, of the way in which um, things like pollution and purity are viewed in women in India, there's a very strong association with the idea of blood and women. So if on one end of the scale, you have the pre-pubertal girl who is extremely holy and unpolluted. So you even have Kanya Puja in certain parts of India because she is so pure. At the other end, you have an menstruating widow who is the most unholy person you can imagine. And yet within this scale, uh, we have Draupadi who claims the imagery of blood so fiercely that she says, for 13 years, I will not groom my hair until I have drenched it in the blood of my enemy. And this idea of blood with women is extremely potent. It is a very fierce symbol, a very fiery symbol, you know, and a very dangerous one. And I thought a woman who can claim this symbol for herself so openly and flout it in front of her husband for 13 years must have some really interesting story to tell us. So I was sure that when I was going to look at the Mahabharat as an antidote, as I was saying to the Ramayana and, and Sita as she's portrayed in the Ramayana, though I'm sure she's more nuanced than the way we are you know, often uh, told about. Uh, so I was pretty certain that I would look at Draupadi most closely to understand how she came to be this extremely mm -hmm. angry woman. Uh, and because anger, feminine anger is something we need to tap into uh, to understand all this simmering rage, really, that lies behind, you know, patriarchal societies like India. Right. 
Thank you. Uh, that's a wonderful introduction to your two separate takes on Draupadi. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, you also brought in some other uh, epic women uh, uh, yes. from the Mahabharata into your book. Yeah. Before yeah. we come to that, may I turn to, uh, to Namita and ask her, because I happened to have a conversation before we started this session uh, with her. And she said that she actually looks at some other women from the epic as being sort of more uh, having greater agency. And uh, she has also a different take on Sita uh, from the one that you mentioned just now. Sure. So yes. over to you, Namita, and you please give us your different take on Sita as well as your take on the women of the Mahabharat who really, in your opinion, have great agency. I have written the Mahabharat for young readers. And in that, of course, the story of Draupadi is a very uh, important part of that story. And uh, who would not respect Draupadi for her spirit and her um, tremendous personality as represented in the epics. But the figure who reached out to me from the very beginning was the figure of Sita. Sita is from the other epic, the Ramayana, and uh, she represents the essential qualities of Mother Earth. She is the Indian woman personified in her strength, and in her grit. Uh, recent soap operas have distorted this and made her appear as, as some kind of a weak victim. But that has been reversed through so many books and stories, including one by Chitra Devakaruni. Uh, why I feel Sita had more agency than somebody like Draupadi is that uh, Draupadi provoked a lot of things to happen in the narrative. Mm, and she was angered. In fact, she didn't wash her hair for 13 years until she had actually bathed in the blood of the man who uh, dishonored her, which is uh, quite something, I must say. But um, Sita, on the other hand, did her duties rigorously. And once her duties were done, once she no longer felt honored as she thought she deserved to be, she rejected her husband, she rejected her royal status and returned to the Mother Earth, to the arms of Mother Earth. So I, I think there is, in my mind, more agency in that act of rejection than in the act of, uh, of anger, which is the, uh, the, the symptom or the symbol of Draupadi's condition. But these are figures for each of us to interpret in our own ways. And the strength of Indian women, their individual strengths, though they are socially vulnerable, comes from these goddesses. And many of them, please do remember, are not goddesses. They are more, somewhere between mortals and immortals, born of both. And they have all the human weaknesses that we do as women and as men. Yes, thank you, Navita. And, uh... Chitra, coming back to you, you took the story of Panchali and you've portrayed her really as a very rounded character, a character who is a flawed character. She is not in any way an ideal woman. She in herself admits to her flaws of anger. She has doubts constantly. And of course, I won't give any spoilers for people who haven't read the novel, but um, it's not just that she's really deeply attached to her husbands, which she is, she is attached to her duty, but uh, she has another attachment also, which lingers at the back of her mind always throughout, throughout the book. So uh, how did you reimagine Panchali or Draupadi in this manner for your novel? That's a great question. But before I jump into it, I just wanted to say something in the defense of Sita, because one of my <laughs> later novels is The Forest of Enchantments in yeah. which Sita is the main character and she speaks her story. And you know, uh, what Ira was saying is so true. When I was growing up, I was often blessed. Be, may you be like Sita. Uh, and I don't think people had much hope because uh, you know I was kind of a rebellious uh, girl, but they constantly kept blessing me, hoping it would take. Uh, so I was kind of against Sita growing up. 
But then I wanted to examine her character. I wanted to learn about her. And I found out when I studied Valmiki, when I studied the Bengali Krittibasi Ramayan, when I studied Adbhut Ramayan, Kamba Ramayan, she is much more of a character of agency, intelligent, standing up against wrongs when she needs to, she speaks her mind, tells her husband Ram what is what, when he says, please stay home with my parents uh, while I go off to the forest. She's like, no, I want to go and have an adventure with you. I love you. My place is by your side, etc. I don't want to say too much about that, but you know, uh, I think it is very important for us to re-examine our mythology for ourselves, for both men and women, because the portrayal of women affects men as well in very deep ways. And therefore, you know, when we look at the various interpretations down the ages before these characters became, um, what shall I say, patriarchalized, if that's a word, I probably just made that up, but you know what I mean? It's really important for us to examine and re-examine them for ourselves. It's, uh, you know, our mythology is a living, powerful thing and we need to use it. So coming in back to hand. Panchali, the question about Panchali, you've portrayed yes. her in all shades, full of uh, both positive and negative qualities. In fact, half the time, and she's very, very deeply unhappy woman most of the time in your novel, right? Yes. Yes, I wanted to show her again in all her complexity. And this has been something I really believe in. And I tried to show this with Sita as well. Um, Draupadi, definitely in the Palace of Illusions. Uh, she does have a temper uh, when she gets upset with her husband. She throws husbands, I should say. She throws yeah. things around the house. Um, <laughs> if they have displeased her, uh, they know not to come home too soon before she gets <laughs> over her anger. So, but also she is very, very intelligent and she, um, she kind of strives to break the bonds that society has put around her right from the beginning where she's not supposed to have the same education as her brother, Trishtha Dhyumna. And all through, all through, she is the one who designs the Palace of Illusions. So she plays a very active role I've always believed in showing a woman as a complex character. Ira was talking about uh, some of the restraints placed around women. If women are expected to be most unfairly and most unrealistically perfect, then you know a lot of things are not allowed to them. But if women are just allowed to be human, the way men have always been allowed in our epics to be human, mm -hmm. You know, even people like Arjun, the great heroes, uh, even Yudhishthir, who was the most uh, holy of all, they are complex characters. They have their flaws, definitely. So I definitely allowed uh, Panchali her flaws. And one of her interesting flaws is her relationship with her mother-in-law, Kunti. Talk about strong women. That's another very strong woman. <clears throat> she also fascinated me. So her story is important as we go through the life of uh, Draupadi Panchali. All right. And uh, Ira, coming to you, the other women that you've also sort of woven, whose stories you've also woven into in your song of Draupadi, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about them as well. Well, uh, yes. Uh, so it was an interesting exercise for me to think about all these other women because, you know, the more I looked at it, uh, this whole question um, came up that actually, um, you know, related to the point I had made earlier, this sort of obsession uh, with certain strictures around women actually arises out of a deep malaise uh, over women's sexuality and how do we control that sexuality? Uh, you know, in in earlier time, now today as well, with you know all the. Uh, in the, way, the many ways in which we're expected to behave in society, but going back to ancient times, there's a deep deep sort of disquiet about how are we going to contain women's sexuality. It was something which seemed to frighten, uh, you know, men a lot. And of course, one way to contain it was to, to have women married very early and then, you know, to, to be with that husband for the rest of their life and um, not encourage remarriage and things like that. Um, and so what became very important at this time was the control of women's wombs. 
who would bear sons, who would have heirs, who would have princely heirs. So the control of elite women wombs. And if we look at the Mahabharata, a lot of the controversy and the troubles arise over this central key issue, over who actually is controlling these wombs. And if we look at the stories, it is often the women within these constraints. So we think it is the men, but the women are doing a lot of maneuvering. So whether we start with Satyavati, who uh, has a premarital you know, liaison, forced liaison with Parasar and has her son Vyas out of wedlock. At that time, she is a completely powerless fisher woman, fisher girl really, she was very young. Mm. But yet when she gets married uh, and realizes, and gets married to Shantanu, the, you know, the king of Hastinapur, and uh, she realizes um, that at this stage in her life, she needs someone to impregnate her daughters-in-law because her sons are, are very ill and dying and unable to bear sons. She brings in Vyas and she calls for him and she says, you are my son, you owe me a, this duty, please do this for my daughters-in-law. So within her helplessness is a sort of power that she is able to exercise. And I found that time and time again, even Kunti, we think of her as this yes. possessed young woman, you know, who was given away at a very young age to another king because he has no children. I mean, you know, how do you do that? Um, but despite that, she uses her iron will, you know, when she has her sons and she keeps them together uh, through thick and thin when there's, she has really nothing, no power behind her, no strong father, no, you know, nothing at all. Uh, and they are completely dispossessed and thrown out. Uh, she keeps them together. She binds their will to hers. She finds a woman for them who will bind them in her place as well, you see. So I was fascinated by the way with how women were nonetheless able to exercise some sort of agency in a world which tried very hard to constrain them and in which the, you know, the dictates were, were pretty rigid. And yet nonetheless, you see time and time again, many of the women able to do that. Some are not able to, like, um, like uh, Amba, for example, Amba, Ambika, and Ambalika. Uh, theirs is a very tragic story. I found it especially tragic for Amba. But some are able to. So that's the sort of thread that I wanted to bring through the whole story, is this whole sort of tussle over the wombs of elite women and mm -hmm. who gets to, to, to control them. You might as well mention some of the other epic women you've dealt with in your novel very quickly. Um, so there's Ganga who comes in right at the beginning, you know, um, uh, she's a very mysterious figure. She's probably a tribal woman. We don't know much about her. She comes in for a very short time and uh, bears a son who then goes on to be pretty central to the story, the, the future Bhishma. Uh, we have the three, uh, you know, uh, princesses, Ambam, become Balika. Uh, who are all who have less of a role they're just there to try and bear sons and they are you know they do that and then they disappear often the women are brought except in except for Amba except, who, for, Amba. except, except for, for Amba who reappears in another who incarnation in another, yes, in exactly and, you know often <laughs> these women appear vengeance. just to further the story quickly like you need a resolution yeah. to a problem so come on bring in a woman or, or, or to blame like uh, yeah, yeah. Was saying, you, know, you need a woman yeah. to blame and you bring this uh, this person in um and then I, the, the, a, a sort of group of, and then there's Gandhari, of course, you know, the matriarch of course. the Guru family and the way in which she is also shackled to her destiny. Yeah, uh, and I might as well put in a little footnote to, for people who don't know the epic, Gandhari is the mother of the hundred cousins of the Pandavas whom they battle. And she is married to the blind king, Dhritarash. And uh, when she finds out that he's blind, she decides to blindfold herself. She willfully blinds herself by blindfolding herself throughout her life uh, so that she can join him in his blindness. And she's a very strong character. Yes, carry on, Ira. Yeah, so, no, so that, that's it. And then, uh, of course, I have a section on uh, a group of women, the widows of all these warriors who die in battle. I'm not really uh, telling anyone something they don't know because they do all die. And then you have this whole group of widows, you know, and how do they, what happens to them, that, that tragic story afterwards, I felt tells us a lot about the way we treat widows in our society today. So that's something that goes back thousands of years. Yes, um, so, yes. yes, generally speaking, uh, so these are broadly speaking, some of the women I talked about. Right. I want to come back to another difference uh, that I found in reading both your books, and that is in the way you deal with the supernatural or the, uh, you know, the godlike elements, the magical elements, uh, because, um, uh, you know, as far as Chitra is concerned, you use that as a wonderful layering in your novel that is very much there, the, the magical aspects of, you know, being Panchali, being born of fire, the astras, the 
you know, all the sort of divine things that happen, uh, which are not explicable by human logic. Whereas um, Ira has taken an approach where she's more or less tried to make the story as if it was a rational story and the magical elements have been more or less leached out of the story completely. And you may try to make it a more human story. So I'm very interested to hear your perspectives, both of you. Chitra first, as to why you retained all the magic of the epic and Ira, why you decided to sort of take it away and leave it as a human story. These two different approaches. Great question. I think I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to retain the magic, both for Palace of Illusions and Forest of Enchantments, because that was one of the things that drew me to our epics, this magical layer of uh, human life. And, uh, you know, I've been interested in that in other novels, such as The Mistress of Spices, which is a novel of magical realism. So I feel that there is a lot in our world, just in our everyday world today, that's inexplicable. We could call it magical. It is certainly mysterious. It is beyond logic. And I wanted to explore all those spaces of the human experience. And uh, the Palace of Illusions with Panchali at its center seemed absolutely the right place to do it. And I did not want to remove those elements from those archetypal elements from her story. I felt they gave her a lot of power. What does it mean to be a woman who was born out of fire? What does it mean to be a woman who will die in ice on the mountains in, you know, up in the Himalayas? What do these <laughs> contrasts mean? How in her life is fire and ice then a, an element a magical element, but also a psychological element. I wanted to bring in Krishna, who is, of course, at once an avatar, so at once human and divine, and have a friendship between develop. And this is all taken from the Mahabharata. In both of my uh, epic novels, I've stayed close to one text or another. And there are so many versions that yes. I had many options uh, to pick and choose. But it was very important to retain through that magic, also a psychological realism. I wanted those two things to pull against each other. So there's a lot of magic, but the motivations for everybody, especially Panchali, they're always very human. Right, and Ira, you've done a remarkable job of uh, uh, taking away the magic as much as possible, making it into a totally human story from something that you've always uh, been familiar to us with all the magical elements, the divine elements in it. So yeah. why did you do so? And did you find it very difficult to do so? Or was it, uh, so, did it require uh, great uh, yeah. sleight of hand <laughs> as far as the <laughs> writing is concerned? But uh, the why of it is, uh, you know, quite simple. It's because at that time when I was thinking about uh, female heroism, it, you know, it led to my uh, first published uh, book, uh, Heroines. But I was thinking about the way in which women are just depicted and accepted as heroic in Indian culture. And I found this strange dichotomy in which uh, historical women are often uh, whitewashed and obfuscated to an extent that they become completely different from their original forms, whether it is a Mirabai who becomes sanitized into this perfect widow at which st stage she steps out of a marital home, whereas we know that she was probably much younger, probably still married. Uh, so many, many such heroic historical figures are presented to us in a very sanitized manner, you know, so that we almost lose touch with the real women. They are transformed into either Virangana, this battle warrior woman, or into, uh, you know, Bharat Mata, a goddess. Whereas the mythological women are presented to us in our day-to-day -day life. They feel much more real. They accompany us. They are, you know, they step just next to us in our life. They, they feel much more real. Uh, so I found this dichotomy interesting and I, I set it as a challenge to myself. I said, okay, we, I'm being told, you know, these, these examples are the one uh, one should follow as a young woman, a young person for daughters, etc. Let us take up this challenge and see whether these lives could have been lived in a real manner. Could the women of the Mahabharata have actually lived, historically speaking, realistic lives? And I had another look and Chitra was talking about the text and how many versions of the Mahabharata we do have. You know, it was not written in one sitting. It was first recited for many hundreds of years and then written over many hundreds of years. So there are many, many versions and editions. So I looked, I was looking at the critical edition which is a project that happened in the early 20th century where scholars try 
tried to sort of um, find as early a version as possible. It was a very difficult task to do, but they looked at the writing, the Sanskrit sources, and they tried to cull out all the excessive later interpolations by Brahmins, philosophical meanderings and such like. And in that version, there's much less magic. So that suited me very well. So I took that text and tried to think around reasons for certain episodes, which would explain instead of the magical elements, the real elements, what women might have done in those situations. And I found that it actually, at least the way I saw it, gave them greater agency. So whether it is Draupadi in the, uh, you know, Sabha, when she is trying to fight for her honor, she doesn't have to think of Krishna and get an endless amount of sari, you know, handed out to her to cover uh, her naked body. She can save herself by virtue of being an educated pandita, a knowledgeable woman, a woman who is confident in the place she has in society and can fight for justice on her own. Um, so in, in many various ways like this, I found that it actually suited me to be able to reclaim agency for these women to remove the magical elements. Sometimes they were, you know, they were clearly, at least to my mind, superfluous to the, to the incident. Right. It's a very interesting take indeed. I want to come to Namita now. I think uh, we're coming towards the end of our time, but I want Namita to uh, give us an overview because Namita, apart from, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything else, uh, you've written uh, both a uh, version of the entire Mahabharat for younger readers and also, uh, again for younger readers, a story of Ghatot Kach, the son that Bhim had by Hidimba. In fact, he was the eldest of the Pandav children and uh, she was the first Pandav wife. So, you know, I'd like to hear from you, first of all, your thoughts about that that relationship with, with Hidimba, who is a, who's not really often referred to in the Ramayana, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Mahabharata. It was not in the popular imagination, at least, not very central to the Mahabharata story. And also a kind of overview of the other epic women in the Mahabharata, uh, whom you've dealt with, all of them you've dealt with in your, in your version of the Mahabharata for younger readers. So over to you, Namita. I would like to begin with the figure of Hidimbi, who, who is somebody very close to my heart for some unknown reason. Um, I wrote a novel for young readers called Ghatotkach and the Game of Illusions, which was a tribute to the mountain demoness Hidimbi and to her son Ghatotkach. I was drawn into the subject for so many reasons. Hidimbi had fallen deeply in love with the Panda Bhim while he was wandering the forests in exile and even killed her brother Hidimba to save the person she had fallen in love with, which was Bhim. She also made the transformation which so many women do make from her rough demoness beauty to a human form and to the stereotypes of physical beauty of those days. And she was a faithful wife and companion in the years in the forest where she bought, bore him a son, which was Ghatot Kaj. Bhim left her after the son was born. Uh, it's interesting that both the women so dear to my heart, Sita, who was the first single mother perhaps in these stories, and Hidimbi was also another single mother. As she was of different racial stock, Hidimbi did not get the status she deserved of the eldest wife and the queen of the Pandavas. She was always the other, as were her son, who did not receive the position and privileges of the eldest son of the Pandavas. In my story, because the, the strength of Indian mythology is it is always reinterpreted, retold, reconsidered. And I wanted today's readers, especially young people, to look at and to honor these uh, figures of Hidimbi and her son Khatot Kach. Mm, it is never static Indian myth. It always moves on with the times. Hidimbi was elevated to a goddess figure because of her sacrifices and penances. And there are at least three major temples dedicated to her in the Himalayas, which is where my hometown also is. Her story reached out to me for her grit, her strength, her loyalty, and her selflessness. She exemplifies true heroism and is my favorite character in the Mahabharata. The other unexpected character in the Mahabharat is Amba. Uh, there were three royal sisters, Amba, Ambika, and Ambalika, 
who were abducted and forced into marriage with Vichitra Virya uh, by the celibate patriarch Bhishma. More on him later. Prince Shalva, uh, who Amba, the, the eldest of the princesses, was in love with, would not accept her back after her abduction. She demanded that Bhishma marry her to make reparations, but he had taken a vow of celibacy. Amba, now note this, Amba swore vengeance and leapt into a fire so she could be reborn as Shikandi, she, who changed their gender and became a female to male transsexual to be able to take revenge on Bhishma. There are many such nuances across the Mahabharata which are very modern and very contemporary and uh, also of those times. Uh, the, the Mahabharata is not a strictly religious text even though the sacred uh, is embedded in it. It's, it's uh, clear whichever way you read them in whichever version you read them that the women in the epic are strong opinionated and capable of both independent thought and individual agency as they are in the Ramayana as well, though that is often uh, misread uh, as making them weaker than they actually were. Uh, I'd like to tell you, Sunit, that when I was growing up in the Kumao Hills in the Himalayas, women in our Brahmin families were forbidden from reading the Mahabharata possibly because of the undesirable examples set by these iconic women. Uh, I'd say that the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are truly among the foundational tales of India. I go back to them again and again for inspiration and wisdom because their understanding of human nature and of ethics and the particularity of different situations is unparalleled in any text anywhere, according to my possibly biased judgment. Yes, thank you, Navita. And uh, Chitra, coming back to you, you took the story of Panchali and you've portrayed her really as a very rounded character, a character who is a flawed character. She is not in any way an ideal woman. She herself admits to her flaws of anger. She has doubts constantly. And of course, I won't give any spoilers for people who haven't read the novel, but um, it's not just that she's really deeply attached to her husband, which she is. She's attached to her duty, but uh, she has another attachment also, which lingers at the back of her mind always throughout, throughout the book. So uh, how did you ima reimagine Panchali or Draupadi in this manner for your novel? That's a great question. But before I jump into it, I just wanted to say something in the defense of Sita, because one of my <laughs> later novels is The Forest of Enchantments, in yeah. which Sita is the main character and she speaks her story. And, you know, uh, what Ira was saying is so true. When I was growing up, I was often blessed. Be like, may you be like Sita. Uh, and I don't think people had much hope because, uh, you know, I was kind of a rebellious uh, girl, but they constantly kept blessing me, hoping it would take. Uh, so I was kind of against Sita growing up, but then I wanted to examine her character. I wanted to learn about her. And I found out when I studied Valmiki, when I studied the Bengali Kritibasi Ramayan, when I studied Adbhut Ramayan, Kamba Ramayan, she is much more of a character of agency, intelligent, standing up against wrongs, when she needs to she speaks her mind, tells her husband Ram what is what. When he says, please stay home with my parents uh, while I go off to the forest, she's like, no, I want to go and have an adventure with you. I love you. My place is by your side, etc. I don't want to say too much about that. But, you know, uh, I think it is very important for us to re-examine our mythology for ourselves for both men and women, because the portrayal of women affects men as well in very deep ways. And therefore, you know, when we look at the various interpretations down the ages before these characters became, um, what shall I say, patriarchalized, if that's a word, I probably just made that up. But you know what I mean? It's really important for us to examine and re-examine them for ourselves. It's, uh, 
you know, our mythology is a living, powerful thing, and we need to use it. So coming back to Panchali, the question about Panchali, you've portrayed yes. her in all shades, full of uh, both positive and negative qualities. In fact, half the time, and she's very, very deeply unhappy woman most of the time in your novel, right? Yes, yes. I wanted to show her again in all her complexity. And this has been something I really believe in. And I tried to show this with Sita as well. Um, Draupadi, definitely in the Palace of Illusions. Uh, she does have a temper uh, when she gets upset with her husband. She throws husbands, I should say. She throws yeah. things around the house. Um, <laughs> if they have displeased her, uh, they know not to come home too soon before she gets <laughs> over her anger. So, but also she is very, very intelligent and she, um, she kind of, strives to break the bonds that society has put around her right from the beginning where she's not supposed to have the same education as her brother Trishta Dhyumna. And all through, all through, she is the one who designs the Palace of Illusions. So she plays a very active role. I've always believed in showing a woman as a complex character. Ira was talking about uh, some of the restraints placed around women. If women are expected to be most unfairly and most unrealistically perfect, then, you know, a lot of things are not allowed to them. But if women are just allowed to be human, the way men have always been allowed in our epics to be human, you know, even people like Arjun, the great heroes, uh, even Yudhishthir, who was the most uh, holy of all, they are complex characters. They have their flaws, definitely. So I definitely allowed... Uh, Panchali, her flaws, and one of her interesting flaws is her relationship with her mother-in-law, Kunti. Talk about strong women. That's another very strong woman. <clears throat> she also fascinated me. So her story is important as we go through the life of uh, Draupadi Panchali. All right. And uh, Ira, coming to you, the other women that you've also sort of woven, whose stories you've also woven into in your song of Draupadi, Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about them as well. Well, uh, yes. Uh, so it was an interesting exercise for me to think about all these other women because, you know, the more I looked at it, uh, this whole question um, came up that actually, um, you know, related to the point I had made earlier, this sort of obsession uh, with certain strictures around women actually arises out of a deep malaise uh, over women's sexuality and how do we control that sexuality? Uh, you know, in, in earlier time, now today as well, with, you know, all the, uh, in the, way, the many ways in which we're expected to behave in society. But going back to ancient times, there's a deep, deep sort of disquiet about how are we going to contain women's sexuality. It was something which seemed to frighten, uh, you know, men a lot. And of course, one way to contain it was to, to have women married very early and then, you know, to, to be with that husband for the rest of their life and um, not encourage remarriage and things like that. Um, and so what became very important at this time was the control of women's wombs who would bear sons, who would have heirs, who would have princely heirs. So the control of elite women wombs. And if we look at the Mahabharata, a lot of the controversy and the troubles arise over this central key issue, over who actually is controlling these wombs. And if we look at the stories, it is often the women within these constraints. So we think it is the men, but the women are doing a lot of maneuvering. So whether we start with Satyavati, who uh, has a premarital you know, liaison, forced liaison with Parasar and has her son Vyas out of wedlock. At that time, she is a completely powerless fisher woman, fisher girl, really. She was very young. Mm -hmm. But yet, when she gets married uh, and realizes, and gets married to Shantanu, the, you know, the king of Hastinapur, and uh, she realizes um, that at this stage in her life, she needs someone to impregnate her daughters-in-law because her sons are uh, very ill and dying and unable to bear sons. She brings in Vyas and she calls for him and she says, you are my son, you owe me a, this duty, please do this for my daughters-in-law. So within her helplessness is a sort of power that she's able to exercise. And I found that time and time again, even Kunti, we think of her as this yes. possessed young woman, you know, who was given away at a very young age age to another king because he has no children. I mean, you know, uh, how do you do that? Um, 
but despite that she uses her iron will you know when she has her sons and she keeps them together uh through thick and thin when there's she has really nothing no power behind her no strong father no you know nothing at all mm-hmm. uh and they are completely dispossessed and thrown out uh she keeps them together she binds their will to hers she finds a woman for them who will bind them in her place as well you see so i was fascinated by the way with how women were nonetheless able to exercise some sort of agency in a world which tried very hard to constrain them and in which the you know the dictates were were pretty rigid and yet nonetheless you see time and time again many of the women able to do that some are not able to like um, like uh, amba for example amba ambika nambalika uh, there's is a very tragic story i found it especially tragic for amba what some are able to so that's the sort of thread that i wanted to bring to the whole story is this whole sort of tussle over the wombs of elite women and mm-hmm. who gets to 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 control them you might as well mention some of the other epic women you've dealt with in your novel very quickly um so there's ganga who comes in right at the beginning you know um Uh, she's a very mysterious figure she's p- probably a tribal woman we don't know much about her she comes in for a very short time and uh, bears a son who then goes on to be pretty central to the story the, the future bhishma uh, we have the three uh, you know uh, princesses ambam bikam balika uh, who are all, who have less of a role they're just there to try and bear sons and they are you know they do that and then they disappear But often the women are brought except in for amba Except, except for amba except for amba who reappears in another incarnation just can be yeah in exactly and, you know often <laughs> these women appear vengeance. just to further the story quickly like you need a resolution yeah. to a problem so come on bring in a woman or or, or to blame like uh, yeah, chit yeah. chat you know you need a woman yeah. to blame and you bring this uh, this person in um and then i the the a, a sort of group of and then there's gandhari of course you know the matriarch of the guru family and the way in which she is also shackled to her destiny uh, yeah, i might as well put in a little footnote to for people who don't know the epic gandhari is the mother of the 100 uh, cousins of the pandavas whom they battle and she is married to the blind king dhritarash and uh, when she finds out that he's blind she decides to blindfold herself she willfully blinds herself by blindfolding herself throughout her life uh so that she can join him in his blindness and she's a very strong character yes carry on ira yeah so, no so that that's it and then now of course i have a section on a, a group of women the widows of all these warriors who die in battle i'm not really telling anyone something they don't know because they do all die and then you have this whole group of widows you know and how do they what happens to them that that tragic story afterwards i felt tells us a lot about the way we treat widows in our society today so that's something that goes back thousands of years yes, um so yes, yes generally speaking uh, so these are broadly speaking some of the women i talked about right I want to come back to another difference uh, that I found in reading both your books and that is in the way you deal with the supernatural or the uh, you know the godlike elements the magical elements uh, because um, uh, you know as far as Chitra is concerned you use that as a wonderful layering in your novel that is very much there the the magical aspects of you know being panchali being born of fire the astras the you know all the sort of divine things that happen uh which are not explicable by human logic whereas um ira has taken an approach where she's more or less tried to make the story as if it was a rational story and the magical elements have been more or less leached out of the story completely and you may try to make it a more human story so i'm very interested to hear your perspectives both of you chitra first as to why you retained all the magic of the epic and ira why you decided to sort of take it away and leave it as a human story these two different approaches great question uh, i think i knew from the very beginning that i wanted to retain the magic both for palace of illusions and forest of enchantments because that was one of the things that drew me to our epics this magical layer of uh, human life and uh, you know i've been interested in that in other novels such as the mistress of spices which is a novel of magical realism so i feel that there is a lot in our world just in our everyday world today that's inexplicable we could call it magical it is certainly mysterious it is beyond logic and i wanted to explore all those spaces of the human experience and uh, the palace of illusions 
with Panchali at its center seemed absolutely the right place to do it. And I did not want to remove those elements from those archetypal elements from her story. I felt they gave her a lot of power. What does it mean to be a woman who was born out of fire? What does it mean to be a woman who will die in ice on the mountains in, you know, up in the Himalayas? What do these <laughs> contrasts mean? How in her life is fire and ice then a, an element, a magical element, but also a psychological element? I wanted to bring in Krishna, who is, of course, at once an avatar, so at once human and divine, and have a friendship between develop. And this is all taken from the Mahabharata. In both of my uh, epic novels, I've stayed close to one text or another. And there are so many versions that I had many options uh, to pick and choose, but it was very important to retain through that magic, also a psychological realism. I wanted those two things to pull against each other. So there's a lot of magic, but the motivations for everybody, especially Panchali, they're always very human. Right. And Ira, you've done a remarkable job of uh, uh, taking away the magic as much as possible, making it into a totally human story from something that you've always uh, been familiar to us with all the magical elements, the divine elements in it. So yeah. why did you do so? And did you find it very difficult to do so? Or was it, uh, so did it require good. great... Uh, yeah. Sleight of hand, <laughs> as far as the <laughs> writing is concerned. But uh, the why of it is, uh, you know, quite simple. It's because at that time when I was thinking about uh, female heroism, it, you know, it led to my uh, first published uh, book, uh, Heroines. But I was thinking about the way in which women are just depicted and accepted as heroic in Indian culture. And I found this strange dichotomy in which uh, historical women are often uh, whitewashed and obfuscated to an extent that they become completely different from their original forms, whether it is a Mirabai who becomes sanitized into this perfect widow at which st stage she steps out of a marital home, whereas we know that she was probably much younger, probably still married. Uh, so many, many such heroic historical figures are presented to us in a very sanitized manner, you know, so that we almost lose touch with the real women. They are transformed into either Virangana, this battle a warrior woman, or into, uh, you know, Bharat Mata, a goddess. Whereas the mythological women are presented to us in our day-to-day -day life. They feel much more real. They accompany us. They are, you know, they step just next to us in our life. They, they feel much more real. Uh, so I found this dichotomy interesting and I, I set it as a challenge to myself. I said, okay, we are, I'm being told, you know, these, these examples are the one uh, one should follow as a young woman, a young person for daughters, etc. Let us take up this challenge and see whether these lives could have been lived in a real manner. Could the women of the Mahabharata have actually lived, historically speaking, realistic lives? And I had another look and Chitra was talking about the text and how many versions of the Mahabharata we do have. You know, it was not written in one sitting. It was first recited for many hundreds of years and then written over many hundreds of years. So there are many, many versions and editions. So I looked, I was looking at the critical edition which is a project that happened in the early 20th century where scholars try to sort of um, find as early a version as possible. It's a very difficult task to do, but they looked at the writing, the Sanskrit sources, and they tried to cull out all the excessive later interpolations by Brahmins, philosophical meanderings and such like. And in that version, there's much less magic. So that suited me very well. So I took that text and tried to think around reasons for certain episodes, which would explain instead of the magical elements, the real elements, what women might have done in those situations. And I found that it actually, at least the way I saw it, gave them greater agency. So whether it is Draupadi in the, uh, you know, Sabha, when she is trying to fight for her honor, she doesn't have to think of Krishna and get an endless amount of sari, you know, handed out to her to cover uh, her naked body. She can save herself by virtue of being an educated pandita, a knowledgeable woman, a woman who is confident in the place she has in society and can fight for justice on her own. Um, so in, in many various ways like this, I found that it actually suited me to be able to reclaim agency for these women to remove the magical elements. Sometimes they were, you know, they were clearly, at least to my mind, superfluous to the, to the incident. 
Right. It's a very interesting take indeed. I want to come to Namita now. I think uh, we're coming towards the end of our time, but I want Namita to uh, give us an overview because Namita, apart from, uh, uh, you know, uh, everything else, uh, you've written uh, both a uh, version of the entire Mahabharat for younger readers and also, uh, again for younger readers, a story of Ghatotkach, the son that Bhim had by Hidimba. In fact, he was the eldest of the Pandav children and uh, she was the first Pandav wife. So, you know, I'd like to hear from you, first of all, your thoughts about that that relationship with with Hidimba, who is a, who's not really often referred to in the Haramayan, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Mahabharata. It was not in the popular imagination, at least, not very central to the Mahabharata story. And also a kind of overview of the other epic women in the Mahabharata, uh, whom you've dealt with, all of them you've dealt with in your, in your version of the Mahabharata for younger readers. So over to you, Namita. What do we do now? We can just continue and choose to end it if we are done with time. Uh, uh, we have, you, how, much, how much time do we have? Can I ask one more question each of... Uh, can, yes. Yeah, one, one more question. Of, uh, Ira and Chitra? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Namita. And so, Ira, any last words on these epic women? With the um, magic taken away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last words, um, yes, uh, in the sense that uh, they are a lot more complex than we imagine them to be. They are, as Chitra was saying earlier, they're much more vulnerable. And as Namita was saying, there are many questionable sometimes, you know, actions. Uh, but they are still fascinating and we need to reclaim them in the perhaps in a state in which they used to be presented to us. You know, they, uh, for some reason, over the years, they have been, you know, reinterpreted in many, many ways. Uh, but their story still has something that has a resonance for us today. And I think it's very interesting. Each and every take is interesting and should be looked at. Thanks, Ira. And Chitra, the last word to you on the epic women and their eternal fascination for us. Yes, I agree with uh, Ira that they truly are, we are fascinated by them because they are fascinating. They are complex. They bring up many moral questions for us, which remain absolutely valid even today. They uh, make us examine the position of women in society. They make us examine the mysterious. They uh, make us think about agency. Truly, how far do we control our lives? And uh, again, going back to that iconic scene that Ira talked about uh, in the Sabha, in the great court, her, uh, Draupadi is going to be shamed, yeah. her clothes are going to be removed. And uh, what I have happening that's really important is that, yes, there is the magical element, but she has to reach inward for her strength. And the lesson that Draupadi learns, which is one I'd love to leave for all our listeners to think about is if I am, if I haven't done anything wrong, why should I be shamed? Why should I allow society to make me feel ashamed? And that is a transformative moment in Draupadi's character. And actually, as I wrote it and I understood it for the first time, because that's what often happens when we write, we understand things. Um, it was a transformative moment for me. Oh, that's wonderful. The power of the epic women being handed down over the hundreds of generations and still being vital today. Thank you so much, all of you. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about these epic women. I must say the Mahabharata can be examined and re-examined because of its immense complexity, its immense variations, as I said, and it always remains relevant to every age, to every time, to all moral questions that arise. And if I might add, you know, in my own little take, uh, after reading so many versions written by the three of you, uh, and that is that perhaps if we have to look at one woman who had real agency in the Mahabharata, it's mostly Satyavati who starts the whole thing, because she's the one who insists that only her sons will be uh, kings and uh, not 
the elder son of the king at that time, which was Bhishma, who becomes Bhishma Pitama, who takes a vow of celibacy and says, yes, I will let, I will protect her sons and their line. And thereby hangs the tale of the Mahabharat. So she is the one who forces the course of the story into the action that eventually ensues. So I think in many ways, she is the one who has the most agency, Satyavati. <laughs> but that's my own take at the end. Thank you very much. It's been delightful talking to all of you. And uh, I, I'm sure all of uh, our listeners and viewers will be impelled to go and read all your books. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chitra, Ira, Namita, and Sunit for an intriguing conversation. Thank you for sharing your perspectives on the lesser known role of women in and from the Mahabharata. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. We encourage you to buy the books of our speakers that are available through the Bra Brazos bookstore. If you like the session, do consider supporting us through the support GLF option button on the right hand side of your screen. We sincerely value your contributions. We would like to thank all our GLF Houston advisors, donors, and partners for generously supporting the festival. We hope you all enjoyed this conversation and will tune in for our next session, Rebel with the Cause, The Paradox of Michael Madhusudan Gatt, Vinita Sudbilani, Kunal Basu, Firdos Asim, and Sadaf Saz in conversation. This will be at 1 p.m. Central Time, which is 11 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Mountain time, and 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you once again, and now presenting a reading from the JLF Writer Show. It was the greatest honor and privilege of my life to be asked to work on a Mahabharata version for young children with the part in Mahabharata. I began this project almost uh, 14 years ago and uh, it took me not very long. I rashly entered into trying to put the longest epic in the world with over 100,000 verses into 40,000 words. But I am so proud of this book, which uh, has uh, been read by now uh, almost uh, more than a decade of school children and also first time readers. I'll read out a little bit. I, I want to tell you before that, that this was the most transformational um, work I've ever done in my life. It is said, whatever there is in the Mahabharat is there in life. And whatever is not in the Mahabharat is not there in life. I do think it's true. When I finished writing this, I was so drained out. I was so trying to process what I had worked on that for two years, I could not write a word of fiction or narrative nonfiction, nothing. Just this story was settling inside me. I, I'll just read out the dedication and the beginning to give readers a sense of this. Um, I, I'd like to tell you about the Mahabharata. The timelines uh, are not very clear. Many Indian scholars place them at about 3000 years BCE based on planetarium software or records of lunar eclipses. Others dated around uh, 400 BC, which is much uh, shorter span of time. It has been retold and recited in many versions and recensions. Uh, my Mahabharat, I begin it like this. I begin by paying homage to Ganga, the river Ganga, and to the Himalayas, the source of the river, and all the stories then spring forth from it. The book celebrates the river Yamuna, by the banks of which Lord Krishna played and sported. It is in memory of the ancient city of Indraprasth, the heart of which still beats under the skin of modern Delhi. It is written with reverence for the dusty fields of Kurukshetra, where in the thick of battle, Krishna explained the laws of karma to his kinsman Arjuna. It is dedicated to the land of Bharat, which renews its past with every living moment and to the next generation of readers who continue to remember and retrieve the stories of an enduring culture as they dream once again of Jaya, the song of victory. Jaya, the story of the Mahabharata. A long, long time ago, in the ancient lands of India, known in those days as Bharat Varsh, a family quarrel grew into a bloody war. 
there have been wars before and there have been wars since. But that mighty battle between warring cousins of the Kuru clan has become a part of the mythology and history of India. Told and retold a million times, the story of the Mahabharata is about defeat as well as victory, humility as much as courage. It is the greatest story ever told. So in that sense, I want to democratize the, 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 the story of innovation. I'm, I want to make it clear that anyone can do it. The basic question that a writer asks, I think, is what should I write about? And um, you know, it, it's, it, that's the biggest question. You know, there's no help for you either. Uh, and it's, it's a total mystery. But what is common throughout history, throughout time, is that when you have that upstairs, downstairs thing, there's a certain amount of that that you can maintain if you're on top through hard power and hard system. We're absolutely delighted to be back here with our edition, albeit digitally, of JLF Houston. There are so many wonderful authors and speakers who you will hear over the next few days. And I hope they will power your imagination as they have ours to look into the future into a brighter tomorrow.